JLL believes you should expect more from your office space. So ask yourself, is your office space working as hard as you are? Does it foster collaboration, fuel productivity, and help build culture? Is it designed with intent? Is it a place you want to be? Your office can be a powerful asset. So put your office to work with JLL and see a brighter way. Learn more at jll.com slash Spotify. Hello, Empire Podcast listeners. Thank you so much for listening to us. Just a quick heads up. This may not be an episode that you want to listen to with young children. Hello and welcome to Empire with me, Anita Arnand. And me, William Durimple. Can we just start with a thank you to all of the listeners who've who've stayed with us and also you new listeners who've joined the podcast to come and hear us talk about Russia. We are absolutely swept away by your enthusiasm. We're so grateful. And um, if you really like us, tell your friends because we're we're kind of now getting used to this, aren't we? this <laughs> growing adulation. I don't know, I don't know what I'll no. do without it. It's kind of crazy. No, it's gone very very well. And uh, I have to say, this series was Anita's idea. We have a, we have a moment in the series when we uh, when we're putting our ideas together, where we start with the mm. theme, but we sing our hymn. Uh, mm. That Anita was right. Uh, yes. And this was uh, right back on the day that uh, Prozhogin moved into Russia. Mm. You got on the on the blower and said, "We have to do Russia next." And I wasn't initially very taken with the idea, but I've been absolutely right. Not not <laughs> taken with the idea is is it mild. <laughs> <laughs> mild. Well, I've always been keen on the great game, but anyway, the Russia, <laughs> Russia, and the great game, as it became, is now our most popular. It's very ever. gracious of you. I am honestly very grateful, but honestly, um, I'm right most of the time. So, it's like, <laughs> it's right. it's irritating okay. but true. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine, but I'll take it. It's fine. Um, look, last week it was very cliffhangery. It was very exciting, wasn't it? Dun dun da. So we left you with the British declaring war and deciding to invade Afghanistan, thinking that they had to do it to ensure the security of India. And that's because Russia was breathing down their necks and there were spies moving around and all sorts of movements and machinations going on. And, you know, as we explained in a previous episode, Afghanistan is strategically so important. If you care about wealth, India looks like your piggy bank in the imperial world. It is a place where everybody wants control over commerce. Over and military. we should say this is not just a modern idea. Today, obviously, we've got many historians looking again at the whole business of empire. And the fact that India, which the British in the post-war generation were brought up to think of as a place of famine, all those adverts of save the children, give five pounds and save Sita's sight, all that sort of thing. Now that we're seeing again India rising, India's overtaken the British economy, it'll overtake that of Japan and Germany in the next 10 years. We are being reminded of the fact that India has always been a very rich place. Mm. In fact, along with China, it's provided about three quarters of the world's GDP for most of human history. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting you mentioned China because China is, you know, potentially heading into some really serious economic headwinds. So where that leaves India... I don't know. I mean, you know, uh, uh, who knows what could happen? Exactly. And and the perception of India as a very rich place rather than a very poor place is not a new one. And in the last episodes, we had this idea of, of Napoleon trying twice, first with an alliance with Tipu Sultan and coming through Egypt, and then in an alliance with the Russians going through Afghanistan and the Khyber Pass to take from the British the source of their wealth. And Napoleon identified India as the thing which had enriched Britain and made it a bigger economy for the first time in history than France. So where exactly did we jump off last time? We had these two very similar characters who had met in actually what sort of seems to be... Burns and Vitkovich. Yeah, yeah, Burns and Vitkovich on opposite sides of this great game, as it was called, who actually like each other and in another yeah. world might have been really good friends because they were quite similar. Absolutely. And when we left it at the end of the last episode, Vikovic had basically won the duel because he was being supported to the hilt by Russia. Mm. And Russia was promising Dost Mohammed, the emir of Afghanistan, everything that he wanted. They promised him armies. They promised him money. Whatever he wanted, it was theirs. While the idiotic governor general in Simla, Lord Auckland, 
was regarding Das Mohammed as his enemy and just ordering him out of the border areas and telling him to throw the Russians out, offering nothing in return, which not only was diplomatically disastrous, but was an idiotic policy. And despite the fact that Byrne had him. He loved Burns. He was all set to eat out of Burns's, Burns's hand. Yeah, exactly. And so Burns is checkmated by Vitkovich. And so you're left with this Russian envoy or spy, Vitkovich, in command of Afghanistan. At the same time, Vitkovich's boss is a guy called Count Simonich, who is the Russian ambassador in Tehran and in charge of their eastern policy. He has persuaded the Persian king to attack the border fortress of Herat. So you have a Russian army and Russian artillery moving across Persia and about to attack what is now Western Afghanistan you know with 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 cossacks and uh, and russian guns so in every way this threat which was at one point just a distant fever dream has actually taken place but what is fascinating is that just as the whole east india company machinery is all set to invade afghanistan with the largest army they've put together since defeating tipu sultan 100,000 troops just as this is about to happen, Russia actually steps down. Well, it's 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 the most peculiar thing. I mean, it is absolutely grabbing defeat out of the jaws of victory <laughs> because they're so well positioned. So why do they do that? Because Nesselrod does not want another full-scale war with Britain. He realizes that they've come out of the whole uh, Napoleonic era and, they, and at this stage, they're not ready for a, a massive war with Great Britain. Mm. So Nesselrod, the foreign minister in St. Petersburg, talks to Palmerston, who's the foreign minister in London, and basically agrees to all his demands. Katsimenech in Tehran will return home. Vitkovich in Afghanistan will return home. The Russian army with withdraw from Herat. And all the causes which have, have, have led to this standoff are taken away. And yet the machinery which has gathered for war on the banks of the uh, of the Sutledge in India is now unstoppable. And they ca- the British carry on this okay. ridiculous plan to invade Afghanistan, even though they don't have a border with it. So, so there's no there's no cause of spell anymore, but they're still going to go ahead. But I just you've made me care about Vitkovich. <laughs> I, I, I've grown fond of Vitkovich in your telling. Does he? he I know the answer. Does he go <laughs> are you, home? Are you going to do a dribble and give away no, the no. story? Alita? Does he, William? Go and live happily ever after, having done a good job, well done, Vitkovich. One of the most exciting bits of research of Return of a King, which involved swooping into archives in, in, in Kandahar and dodging bullets and all sorts of stuff. I had more fun writing this book than anything else I've ever done. What? But- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. What? <laughs> I, got, I got shot at into the sniper's bullet on the back of my I feel car like that too, just now. Ouch. <laughs> Go on. And getting all these manuscripts, amazing manuscripts out of Afghanistan and, 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 and translating them and, and, and getting the story from the Afghan side. But one of the most exciting moments was discovering what had happened to Vitkovich. And there are allusions to this in a few books, but um, I was put onto a wonderful researcher in Moscow who was a friend of the great British scholar of the great game and Central Asia, Alexander Morrison. And she found these letters. So Vitkovich, having been dismissed from Afghanistan and withdrawn by the foreign minister, just as he's on the verge of victory, everything he's worked towards in the last 20 years is terrific achievement for this boy who had once been a rebel against the, the Russians, who was a young aristocrat from Lithuania, who had been exiled to the steppe for anti-Russian activity of starting a, a resistance movement called the Black Brothers. All his friends have died in these prison camps. He, by his sheer brilliance, has risen to the top of his profession. He's become an agent working for the Russians. And now he's returns home. And the different accounts are circulating about what happens next, because about a month after he returns to St. Petersburg, his landlady knocks on his door with a samovar of tea in the morning, and there's no answer. And eventually the door is broken down and there is Vitkovich sprawled in a chair and a pistol on the floor and he's blown his brains out, apparently. <clears throat> so <Did> immediately. <laughs> <What do> you... <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I'm just talking, you know, about we're, we're living in an era where oligarchs are falling out of windows <laughs> by accident. Exactly. You know, this is also an era when spies are being played against each other. And the fact that this Russian agent is discovered in an apparent suicide with his papers either missing or burnt. Mm -hmm. And there's a little um, burnt ash in the grate. 
has exactly the same sort of conspiracy theory effect uh, with everyone interpreting it differently as happened with the death of Prigozhin. Mm. A lot of people in the West assume that it, it's Putin. Some people in Russia are assuming it's British intelligence. This is what happens with Vitkovich. And the first theory is what the British think when they hear this news. Their spies in St. Petersburg say that Vitkovich went back to St. Petersburg. He presented himself to the foreign ministry. And Nestle Road sent out a message that he knew no Captain Vitkovich other than an adventurer using the name of Russia and that uh, he's to be escorted out of the foreign ministry premises. In other words, he's been totally disowned. Mm. So that's what the British believe, that he's been disowned, that he goes back to his rooms and he blows his brains out. So that's the account that is being circulated in Whitehall. In Russia, on the other hand, they think it's a job, a hit job by British intelligence, that it's an assassination. Plus ça change, <laughs> my friend. Plus ça change. And they assume that some British spy has got into his lodgings, shot him, mm. made it look like a suicide, taken all his papers from his Afghan notes and everything, burnt a few of them in the grate to make it look like uh, he'd, he'd burnt his papers, and taken the intelligence back to London. But there's a third, there's okay. a third version. All right, go on. And this is what I think actually happened, because we found in Moscow some sources of Vitkovich's friends. These guys who had been patriots together at the beginning when he was a teenager in Lithuania fighting the Tsarists uh, and regarding the Russians as occupiers of his homeland. And the story is that having come back to St. Petersburg, although he'd been withdrawn, he was regarded as a, as a great hero by the Russians, according to this version. And he had been received with honor by Nestle Road, which was very different from the story that the British were being told. That he had been walking around St. Petersburg. He brought himself a splendid new pair of pistols with sort of silver accoutrements uh, on them. And he'd always had a great interest in, in armaments. And moreover, like some scene from a, from a Tolstoy novel, mm. he had gone to the theater in St. Petersburg and had been waving from a box at his friends. And the story is that as he was coming out, having been fated by everyone, because the story had come around, here was this dashing intelligence officer who'd just come back from the front, who'd done amazing things in Afghanistan and, and achieved so much. And allegedly waiting outside the theater was one of his, his former school friends from Lithuania. And he said, Pan Vitkovich, what have you done? You were once, a, uh, you were once a, a nationalist who bled for our motherland. How could you have sold out like this? How could you be working for the very enemies? Oh, my God, it's so cinematic. <laughs> and, and that point, according to this version, and I think this is what actually happened, he goes back to his lodgings covered in shame and guilt, maybe a little bit drunk too after a yeah. night out at the theatre, and blows his brains out. Either way, he's dead. Poor focus, fade to black. I mean, it really is. It's just, a, it's, a, it's an extraordinary story. So we're just going to, we're just going to turn our gaze or turn the camera just for a second uh, away from Russia and talk about Britain for a while. I mean, Russia's in the background. We're going to come back to it. But it's really important to know in The Great Game, what is Britain thinking at this time? What are they thinking? What are they doing <laughs> Particularly, and what is the motivation for if you know you how you don't feel under you must know that you're not under threat anymore for Russia to to cut off your supply lines or your access to India. The East India Company must know this, and yet they press on. Why? So the there is still great Russophobia in Britain. This is now 1839, and it's only whatever it is, 15 years since Waterloo. And what has happened is that, like the Second World War, you've seen the former allies turn on each other. The two forces, Russia and Britain, which joined together to defeat Napoleon, now find themselves rivals everywhere. They find themselves rivals in the Ottoman sphere, in Turkey, in Persia, uh, in the Caucasus, and particularly in Central Asia and Afghanistan. So the East Indian machinery, having prepared for war, just grinds on. And I mean, the great sort of most ridiculous thing about this is not only was there no threat originally, even the distant manifestations of that threat have now been removed. Vitkovich is, is back in St. Petersburg and dead. Simonich has been withdrawn from Tehran, and yet still these people want to go to war. And what is driving them, of course, is not only the fact that there is momentum behind this decision to invade Afghanistan, they also want to make a profit for it. Mm -hmm. If you are a British military officer, this is your chance to double your earnings. It's always the moments of conquest that soldiers make their fortunes because they get a share of what's called the prize money, the loot. 
And if you go to any military country house in Great Britain where there's been soldiers active, you will see these bits of loot on display in National Trust houses, in, in gorgeous stately homes across the country, things taken from Kabul or Sri Rangapatnam, the capital of Tipu, or Lucknow in the mutiny. These things are divided up among the soldiers. So if you're a soldier, it hugely suits you to carry on with the invasion. But also, if you are Lord Auckland and the Governor General, your big hope is that this is the moment when you can take the Indus, move into Central Asia, and turn Afghanistan and all the caravan cities beyond into markets of British goods, just as the British East India Company had succeeded in, in taking the Ganges and moving British goods up to Allahabad, Delhi, Agra, and so on. And they just want you know the, the original Clive conquest of India, part two now to its west, taking the Indus and Afghanistan. Okay, but that's fine. I mean, you can want, you know, if wishes were fishes or whatever the saying is, that's fine. <laughs> but, but Britain, even though you're looking at the, um, you know, so the expanding creeping pink on the map of, of India, they don't have a border with Afghanistan. <laughs> this, is the, this is the great <laughs> irony of it. Well, there's a huge empire in the way, which which is your people, the uh, the empire of the Punjab. The Punjab, yes. Oh, always at the bottom of every slight difficulty <laughs> and change of plans. <laughs> Nothing changes there either. But look, there is the empire of Ranjit Singh in between because Britain does not have a border. So if you want to if you want to invade a country, <laughs> helps to have contact with the country that you're going to invade. And does Ranjit Singh want the British marching across his territory? Absolutely not. Just if, in case you're a bit hazy on the map at this point, this is more or less where the modern boundaries are, except where the Kingdom of the Punjab is, is now Pakistan. So if you're India wanting to invade Afghanistan, you can't mm. because... Pakistan's in the way. And this is exactly the case in the 1830s. So what they have to do is they have to persuade Ranjit Singh that they are not going to interfere in his kingdom. And Ranjit Singh is completely clear, you are not moving British troops through my territory. He says that from the beginning. Not too keen on having a foreign army marching through because he's assembled quite a, a militaristic and very strong uh, kingdom of the Sikhs. Under ex-Napoleonic generals. This is the fascinating yes. thing for me. Allard and people like that. Yeah. The Allard, yeah. Uh, Ventura, Italians and French who previously fought with Napoleon, who had nothing to do after Napoleon's armies had disbanded after Waterloo. They cross Persia and Afghanistan and they find jobs for themselves running what's called the Forgy Cast, the, the special army. Yes, Ranjit this, Singh, which yes. is trained very much on the Napoleonic model. Okay, so now we and we've got to skip on now. So okay, he's in the middle. So what do the British intend to do about this impediment? So Ranjit Singh says, "You can't come through my country, but what we will do is that we will give you a terrific send off." So they meet over the border at a place called Ferozpur, which is just inside Ranjit Singh's dominions on the border of, of the East India Company's dominions. And there they decide to have a sort of field of the cloth of gold, mm. Punjabi style, where, as you know, the Sikhs are never going to be outdone by, by anyone. And there's wonderful descriptions. There is a nephew of Lord Auckland, the Governor General, who is his ADC, and he, who's normally incredibly cynical, describes this as one of the most extraordinary spectacles he's ever seen. He says, behind us, there was a large amphitheater of elephants belonging to our own camp. Facing them were thousands of Ranjit's followers, all dressed in yellow or red satin, with quantities of their led horses trapped in gold and silver tissues, and all of them sparkling like jewels. I really never saw so dazzling a sight. Three or four Sikhs would look like Astley's circus broke loose, but this immense body of them saved splendor from being melodramatic. <laughs> Uh, Can I just say, <laughs> Punjabis are still like that. We bring the bling. <laughs> the, the gold the tissue sounds wedding. very familiar from any mm -hmm. wedding in Delhi. Exactly. Yeah, huh? But it's also sort of, you know, incredible confusion because you've got the East India Company army, you've got the Sikh army. Both of them don't really trust each other. And there's one moment when, when there's a sort of surge towards Ranjit Singh and the Sikhs start lighting their matchlocks, expecting right. there's some assassination attempt with some trick in order. Again, surprisingly, the British are not trusted at this right. point uh, by anyone, even their own allies. And the future historian of the Afghan war, Sir John Kay, who's a young officer there at this field of the cloth of gold of, of Ferozpur, describes a scene of indescribable uproar and confusion. And uh, he says that, um, that the Sikhs suspect there's a British plot to do away with their beloved leader, begin to blow on their matches, that is, prime their matchlocks, and grasp their weapons with an air of mingled drift trust and ferocity. 
But mm. speeches begin, and Lord Auckland, who's this very sort of grey character <laughs> surrounded by his two sisters, makes a most splashy answer to Ranjit's speech of welcome about their united armies conquering the world. And Fanny Eden, his sister, writes to the third sister in England, you will be much taken aback, I guess, when they march hand in hand and take Mockham. <laughs> <laughs> She's funny. Is she the one yeah. who says, my peace-loving brother is once again coming? Well, that's Emily. There's that's the two, the so there's these two very oh, washed sisters. They are very funny. And so we have this whole sort of extraordinary sort of Jane austen voice on all this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what, what I loved about writing this book, Return of a King, was that you get both the kind of Jane austen voices of, of Emily Eden. You get epic poems from the Afghan side, which I, which I found in Kabul and Kandahar. You get all these different sources. And they're all so different from each other, but they're all describing the same well, events. You know, I, I've always loved Emily Eden, as you know. Um, but Fanny, I didn't realize Fanny was so funny. And she actually, at this, this ceremony, she ends up sitting next to Ranjit Singh at a dinner. <laughs> Which is always a dodgy, a dodgy plasma. <laughs> well, I just, I just, God, no, I'd love it to sit next to either of these two. And she's charmed by him because, I mean, he does this thing where he doesn't wear all his jewels. He's, he's sort of like the anti Punjabi in his dress, you know. <laughs> Everyone else in his court is in gold tinsel. Yes, yeah. exactly. But he's sort of white kurta pajamas with um, just one single adornment, which is the Kohinoor diamond That's right. on his arm. Our yeah. old friend, it keeps coming back. Yeah. Okay. And he was, um, and he was and trying he, to get. He, he spends. <laughs> <laughs> I just he's love this get a drunk. <laughs> That's what he's trying to do. It's flying fanny with drink. There's a lovely, lovely description. She writes. She says, "He tried to make me drink the composition he calls wine, but it's more <laughs> like burning fire and much stronger than brandy." He noted oh, afterwards. At first, he was content to let George, who's Lord Auckland, swallow it. Then he mm. began plying me with gold cupfuls. I got on very well for some time, pretending to drink it and passing it to his cupbearer. But he grew suspicious and put up his one eye, looked well down into the cup, <laughs> shook his head, and gave it back to me. Oh, no. Next time he put his oh, finger in yes, To see how much he drank. Yeah, go on, can I let me do this bit? So he, put, he dipped his finger in it into the cup to see how much had gone. And I made Major Wade explain that ladies do not drink so much in England, upon which he waited until George's head was turned and passed a cup to me under his arm. <laughs> George was a horrid tyrant. He prevented me. Isn't it great? And then on the other side, he's got Lord Auckland's ADC, uh, William, yeah. and he's asking William why Lord Auckland is not married. Do you want to do this? It's the most wonderful dialogue. Oh, yeah, shall we? Let's do it together. I tell you what. <laughs> shall I do the questioner, and you be you be you do, you be Ranjit Singh, and I'll be okay. I'll nephew. be Ranjit Singh. Okay. Is Lord Auckland married? No. What? He has no <laughs> wives at all. None. <laughs> why doesn't he marry? I don't know. Why don't you marry? <laughs> I can't afford it. <laughs> Why not? Are English wives very expensive? Yes, very. <laughs> that's, that's great. <laughs> then he says, oh. his comeback is even better. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Ranjit Singh was like, I wanted one myself some time ago and I wrote to the government about it, but they didn't send me one. <laughs> <laughs> But so what's interesting is this is all slightly a smokescreen because Ranjit Singh has this means of sort of getting everybody drunk and, and plying them charming with liquor them, and yes. charming them and then finding out where their, their cavalry divisions are placed. He's a very, <laughs> very canny operator. And the British realise this. And there's this lovely quote by the ADC, the nephew, William Osborne, who says, yeah. ill-looking as he undoubtedly is, the countenance of Ranjit Singh cannot fail to strike everyone as that of a very extraordinary man. So much intelligence. And the relentless wandering of his single fiery eye excites so much interest that you are forced to confess that there is no common degree of intellect and acuteness developed in his countenance, however odd his first appearance may be. Can I just say how, how <laughs> absolutely pleasurable it is to read these sort of intelligence reports? I mean, and I wonder whether intelligence reports these days are written in the same, in the same kind tone, of way. Yeah. yeah, in the same tone of, you know, sort of like sometimes just downright affection or, you know, uh, that that kind of being impressed by something it's 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 really interesting so one of the the clever things that ranjit singh has done is not only has he stopped the main force going through the punjab and he said that he will he will send his own force up the khyber pass when he's ready and of course he never actually does so that means that the invasion force has to go right through what is now baluchistan via uh via quetta uh, which is this uh, completely inhospitable route Arid, through desert. Dry, yeah. And because he's dragged his feet, it's now summer. 
So all mm-hmm. the British troops have arrived on this campaign in their winter uniforms of thick fustians and, and all God. their winter kit. And they're now expected to march through the 42 degrees of the Baluchi Desert and the Bolan Pass. And so suddenly, after having had all this fun and games with Ranjit Singh and drinking his hell brew and, and, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> trademark. <laughs> trademark. They now, <laughs> they now have to uh, actually invade Afghanistan. And it's a big mm. army. In the end, after the Russians withdraw, they realize they won't need quite such a big army. So it, but it's still 14,000. East India Company sepoys, 6,000 irregular, and these are Afghan cavalry from Rohil Khand, uh, the Rohillas, hired by mm-hmm. Shah Suja, around 21,000 troops in all, accompanied by 38,000 Indian camp followers. Now, can I just take a pause for a moment? Because we have mocked in the past in this series, Mohammed Shah Rangila for bringing acrobats courtesans dancers <laughs> jugglers i always regret that because i love i yeah. love Mohammed yeah, no, no. Yeah, but, yeah. It, but it's i mean it was it was it was not it wasn't boding well for the battle shall we say. <laughs> <It's true>. <laughs> but in this one i mean there's lady sale is in part of this posse and she decides that it's a good idea to bring a grand piano well, that's the least of it. Um, there's one <laughs> no, brigadier. Just, wait a minute. Years. She brings a grand piano to the invasion. Wouldn't you? <laughs> You're invading you Afghanistan. Of course you need. Of First course of all, I wouldn't need. bring Lady Sale <laughs> for a start. Lady Sale, we should explain who she is. Lady Sale is the wife of one of the more competent officers who's called Fighting Bob Sale, or soon mm-hmm. be christened Fighting Bob, because he's one of the few British officers that actually does put up a fight. But it's an extraordinary army, and no one is travelling light. One brigadier claims mm-hmm. that he needs 50 camels to carry his kit, while General Cotton took 260 for his. 300 camels a year mark for the military wine cellar, and even wow. junior officers travel with as many as 40 servants, ranging from cooks and sweepers and bearers to water carriers. And there's one camel, which carries nothing except eau de cologne for the officers. Eau de cologne, no. <laughs> Plus... They have, of course, to bring their foxhounds. Uh, so a whole pack of, course, of, course of they regimental do. foxhounds. Of course they do. They go to Afghanistan. Of course they need it. Right. So it's a kind of complete, uh, you know, this is this sort of ridiculous. And there are pictures of this. I had great fun uh, in Return of a King getting all these pictures out of the India office library. And there's this long sort of strip cartoon that's about sort of 30 feet long that you can open out with a picture of all these guys with their foxhounds and grand pianos and all the rest of it. Okay, so, so I mean, I would venture, <clears throat> they don't know what, what they're going into, um, obviously carrying all their stuff. No, that's exactly it. The one thing they haven't brought with them, they brought their eau de cologne, they brought their wine cellar, they brought the foxhounds, but they haven't brought a map. <laughs> <laughs> no map. No really? map. Really? Oh, and, and the last right. minute, they realise they haven't got a map. And Mm. so someone at Ferrisport approaches General Allard, who's this wonderful old Frenchman with a forked beard who Emily Eden loves. She says before he eats, he tucks one end of his forked beard over one ear and the other (laughs) end. He's the one who's he's the Napoleonic general who's working for Ranjit Singh now. Who has a lovely, beautiful Mm. Kashmiri wife and Mm. and these gorgeous half French, half Kashmiri children who end up in Saint Tropez of all places. Right. Uh, And there's a wonderful picture of them in retirement on 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 the French coast. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he has in his youth travelled through Afghanistan and kept a very detailed journal of the different passes and roads through Afghanistan with sketch maps. And that's the best they have. So they Mm. buy this off him for some unbelievable sum, the equivalent of uh, of several hundred thousand pounds in modern currency. And Allard parts with his his youthful sketchbook. And this is all they have. So you have these pictures of these guys streaming over the desert and they meet some sort of Baluchi shepherds and you can see these ant-like armies stretching off in different directions and you know it's the scene one has in in, in India today you know which which way and someone says go straight yes. <laughs> <See they die. laughs> sometimes they don't even say it they just point vaguely there's not words With don't look of, of absolutely no disdain. conviction <laughs> no disdain as well it's like oh, I'm not really sure I care where you end up but it's somewhere there okay so so they're not prepared They've got basically a GCSE piece of homework to guide them. 
through some really <laughs> treacherous terrain. year old sketch map. <laughs> okay. On top of that, they've got this uh, ridiculous man in charge of them. There's this guy, Sir William McNaughton, oh, who's a bookish yeah. and bespectacled former High Court judge who has these blue... Uh, <laughs> blue tint. Blue tinted blue tint. glasses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which is the latest thing. And he's sitting on top of an elephant translating the Arabian Nights as he invades Afghanistan. <laughs> I love him because he's so peculiar, but I sort of have nerdy fop. <laughs> kind of thing I describe him as yeah, and and Osborne, the, the the waspish diarist, says poor McNaughton should never have left the secretary's office. Mm. He's ignorant of men, even to simplicity, and utterly incapable of forming and guarding administrative measures. Mm. Mm. So it's not looking good. No, and, it's and, not and good. even 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 worse, as if it could get worse. You know, right? They're, they're armed with some you know sort of terrible map that's not a map, but it's a sketchbook of ideas and thoughts. They have got. I've just found this. this this wonderful yeah. list from my, from my uh, book. There's this yeah. guy, uh, one officer, a camel with best manila cigars, uh, while others come with jams, pickles, cheroots, potted fish, yes. hermetically sealed meats, plate, crockery, glass, wax candles, and table linen. So they can have a nice picnic. Well, all of that's fine. A pate <laughs> and, and crudités are fine. But it's not going to march an army. So they suddenly realise that they don't have enough food to do this. You know, sort of, so this sort of slowly starts dawning on them and their grand piano and their eau de cologne. They thought they might be able to live off the land, but it becomes clear that is never going to happen. So there's this extraordinary moment when to feed the troops, just to get them through, Burns buys 10,000 sheep there and then. At exorbitant prices. Well, uh, can you imagine being the, the shepherd? You want what? <laughs> you want how much? <laughs> you need it how badly? I mean, that must have been quite the red letter day for whoever had the sheep. Whichever shepherd was there, exactly. Mm, and okay. there's some guy they meet halfway through the desert and he looks at this enormous army passing and he goes up to Burns and he says, how many troops are you taking in? He said, you will manage to get them in, maybe a few of them, but how are you going to get them out? Well, join us after the break when we find out actually how very prescient that comment turns out to be. Uh, something that has sounded pretty comedic very soon will turn to something absolutely horrific. Join us then. This episode is brought to you by Google. The Google Cybersecurity Certificate provides the necessary skills to begin a career in cybersecurity. Visit safety.google forward slash cyber workforce today. JLL believes you should expect more from your office space. So ask yourself, is your office space working as hard as you are? Does it foster collaboration, fuel productivity, and help build culture? Is it designed with intent? Is it a place you want to be? Your office can be a powerful asset. So put your office to work with JLL and see a brighter way. Learn more at jll.com slash Spotify. Welcome back. So just before the break, we were, I mean, we were sort of making light of a, a shopping list of items that um, these British troops were taking in for their invasion of Afghanistan. But there are very few laughs in what happens next, William. That's true. So what you've got now is however many, nearly 20,000 East India Company sepoys who are from the plains of Avad and Bihar. They're a long way from home. They're in their winter uniforms. And they're asked to march in military uniform through the height of the Baluchi summer. And they begin to drop like flies. Some of the wells have been poisoned. So they arrive after thousands of miles of march to find there's no water for them. And about half the troops are dead by the time they get to the Bolan Pass. It, it is, as you say, it's, it's not at all a comedy at this point. There are some wonderful descriptions of their struggle to get they've got they also got all their cannon with them and there is no road so the cannon is having to be dismantled hauled up with ropes up these mountain defiles i mean can we just before you read your thing i mean just just spend one moment the topography of the bolan pass is really important to know because it is not flat it is not wide it is you know there are no clear sight lines apart from you can go straight ahead but anybody perched in any of the crags on either side of you has got sniper sights on you very very easily i mean what else can we tell them about bolan pass it's a very very narrow pass i've actually been through it once on a train years ago from quetta to lahore and in the 1890s the british spent years trying to build a railway through this pass 
and it is like going into a tunnel for about yeah. 20 miles. Uh, it, it, is, it is incredibly narrow. Yeah. Here's the quote again. You have brought an army into the country, he said, but how do you propose to take it out again? I love that. I love mm. that line. Mm. Anyway, the roads which had not been properly surveyed or improved by military engineers were almost impossible to move artillery along. At first, eight horses had to be attached to each gun, as well as lines of sepoys with drag ropes. Then, as it grew steeper and stonier, the guns had to be dismantled and carried through by hand. Each gun, each tumbrel and wagon had to be separately handed down by manual labour, wrote one of the majors. The ascent was so steep that some did not like to ride up it. A few camels fell and stopped the rest behind. The baggage was attacked with considerable spirit by the Baluchis at the head of the pass. 49 camel loads of grain were carried off. The rear guard found on the road the mutilated bodies of many camp followers. So this is not an easy, they haven't even got to Afghanistan. They're still in Sindh and they're already losing huge numbers of troops. But they just press on because there's no way they can go back now. And by the time they debouch into the green fields around Kandahar, they have the element of surprise because no one in Afghanistan has has thought they could make it through. Uh, they thought it's absolutely madness that anyone would attempt this in the middle of summer. Well, I mean, and did, and did we talk about how much they lost? Because it was just like, you know, those those images of when you get sort of sardines together and, and, and then packs of birds just take whatever they want again and again. And, and that's what it's like for these poor guys walking through the Bolan Pass. You know, they're, they're, we're talking thousands of pack animals are taking camels, horses, elephants, all of their loads, everything, just, you know, it, 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 fish in a barrel is just the, the thought. This is an Afghan account. There's an Afghan guy called Mirza Atta, and he is traveling with Shah Shuja's party at the end, at the rear of the column. Mm. And he said that he felt lucky to be alive and make it through as they were dodging the bullets raining down from columns of Baluchi snipers sheltering in the faults and crevices in the rocks above. The army entered the defiles of the Bolan Pass, he wrote. The pass was rugged and stony, ringed with mountain peaks scraping the sky. The army gazed in dismay, and the Baluch mountain tribesmen did not delay to snipe and plunder. Thousands of pack animals, horses, elephants, and their loads were lost. Crossing the pass was extremely difficult. Already two months earlier, the English had sent two cannons and thousands of donkey loads of gunpowder to the pass in order to try and clear the route and had to drag them up with ropes one by one. Other supplies were transported with similar difficulty at the cost of losing great numbers of camels, horses, bullets, as well as soldiers who died from lack of food and water, not to mention the military equipment that was plundered. In that waterless, hellish defile, they spent three days and nights, and supplies were so scarce that half a seer of flour could not be had even for a gold rupee. Oh, gosh, that is, I mean, that's such a yeah. vivid description, description of what would be desperation among people who are thirsty, hungry, and battle-weary and frightened. But what's in their favour is that no one actually thinks they can do this. <laughs> Nobody would be bonkers enough to do this. <laughs> so when they do, yeah, exactly. They're like, when oh. they arrive at the far side, they find themselves outside Kandahar and no one sees them coming. And at this point, I think they just, Kandahar surrenders without even a fight. And it's so easy, they then think, we can, we'll can. we just carry on, we'll keep this element of surprise. So they leave behind their cannon and artillery park because they've got intelligence that Ghazni, the next town on the route, has no walls. And so they march on for another two weeks hmm. and they arrive in Ghazni to find that in actual fact it's got the largest walls in, in Afghanistan. Right, right. So again, this is the scrapbook of Allard is not completely up to date. <laughs> right. Absolutely hmm. not. And... Uh, the travelling with the army is Burns and his wonderful Kashmiri assistant or head spy, Mohan Lal. And Mohan Lal manages to debrief a deserter who's been in the fortress. And he says this whole fortress is impregnable, except the Kabul gate, which they haven't bricked up. And if you were to go tonight and just charge it with a, a bag of gunpowder, you have a chance of taking it. And that's what happened. They uh, they do a surprise attack the first night they arrive. They put an enormous sack of gunpowder next to the door. They light the fuse and they attack it. And they take Ghazni in a single night. That's amazing. Mm. Uh, and without any artillery. I mean, it's you know amazing bravery on the, the party who are actually lighting the 
No, I mean, extraordinary uh, bravery. So, I mean, that that is amazing. Also, what they're doing along the way, though, is they're seeding revolt along the way as well. So if they're passing Afghans, you know, it's that sort of thing of, listen, we've got your real king. Your real king, you say, Dost Muhammad is not your real king. We've got Shah Shuja, your real king. We are here. We are here to help you. And we're here to make everything right again. And they want those ripples. You know, you throw a pebble and the ripples go out to proliferate. And it's it's quite effective, isn't it? Because there is still a, a real tear in sentiment among Afghans of, of who is their rightful king. But what legitimacy Shah Shuja has is totally undermined by the fact that he's traveling with, in the eyes of the Afghans, an infidel army. Mm. And... There's this moment after they've taken Ghazni when a group of jihadis who have come to try and help the defenders are brought before Shah Shuja and they accuse him of being an infidel. And one of them lunges at him with his dagger and said, uh, you dog, you've brought infidels into Afghanistan, you will die. And of course, the guy is, is, is captured and, and disarmed. And then Shah Shuja just gives the order that all the prisoners should be massacred. And they're unarmed. I mean, it should be said they're probably unarmed and bound. I mean, that is that is barbaric. So this is what this is the moment that everyone begins to realise that Shah Shuja might, not be, might not be the mm. uh, might not be the the pliable returning king that they'd hoped for. Mm. But they press on, and by this stage, such is the effect of this double extraordinary victory, the surprise appearance outside Kandahar. Then they've taken Ghazni, which Ghazni, has been yeah. very very well armed without a single cannon to help them that Dost Muhammad loses his nerve and he flees off to the north, getting as far as Bukhara before he's arrested by the emir of Bukhara and thrown into the famous pit, this horrible flea-ridden pit where the emir of Bukhara throws his prisoners. In fact, there are other British prisoners, a guy called Connolly who ends up in there. Wait a minute, when you say the famous pit, I've never heard of this pit. So why is this a famous pit? And when we're saying pit, because, you know, you you have phrases like black hole of Calcutta. We should explain, what is it a prison? Is it a cell? Or is it actually a hole in the ground? What are we talking about? So the Emir of Bukhara controls this caravan city, Bukhara, which at this period is, is surrounded by wasteland. And people traveling through it have to pass through this territory, which at this point in history is not irrigated and there's no food at all. It's also famous for its slavers and parties which have tried to cross this are often taken away by Uzbek slavers and sold in the slave markets. And the emir is famous for locking up anyone who comes without authorization to his court. And several British explorers who've tried to pass through Bukhara have ended up in this prison. And anyone that reads the literature of the great game has heard about this prison. There's this character called Connolly, who I think is the guy that originally coins the phrase great game and from whom Kipling gets the phrase. He ends up in the pit and is eventually killed. And this, at this point, this is the, the emir of Afghanistan, Dost Muhammad, fleeing his city and 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 longing to to get shelter and sanctuary, is treated like a, a, an unauthorized evader and is simply thrown into this this pit prison. It, th- mm. There is no ladder out of it. It is covered with vermin and I think rotting bodies of people who've been in there before. It's it's one of the kind of regular sort of Orientalist tropes of Dante's Inferno yeah, hell. Of this place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so. As Dost Muhammad has now gone off, there is no opposition. And it's very like any invasion of Afghanistan you ever read about. As soon as the strength of an invading force is clear, everyone doesn't fight. And the the army passes with incredible speed through the land and takes the capital. So this happened in 2001 or 2002 after 9-11, when the Americans just found they, they had an easy route to Kabul. It happened to the Taliban two years ago when they when the American power started crumbling. Mm. Again, the Taliban just motored on. And it happens in this case in 1839, when the army, having proved itself in Ghazni and in Kandahar, takes Kabul with almost without a shot. So, but if they think that you know, everyone is going to be throwing up their hands in the air saying, yay, Shah Shuja is back, hooray, hooray. They are wrong. Well, they are wrong, but it's not immediately clear that they're wrong. And in fact, there's an awful lot of, oh, we told you so, you were, you were thinking it was so difficult. And all these hawks from the, from the East India Company political department who've been pushing for this invasion all have this moment when they say, we told you so. You, know, you said it was going to be terribly difficult. Look, we've taken it and we've barely lost any troops to fighting. There's just been a little bit of a skirmish outside Ghazni. Uh, otherwise, mm. it's been plain sailing. So you get this extraordinary first winter mm. in Kabul when the British treat it like a hill station in India. 
Lady Sale arrives with her grand piano intact and has enough seeds. I mean, that's crazy. It is intact, isn't it? It's the one thing that they get. It's made it up the Boland Pass somehow Amazing. on the back of an elephant. Yeah. And enough seeds to begin her kitchen garden, which she fills with English blooms, she writes. She, she had been based in Agra, and she was famed for her garden there. So she, she starts having a chrysanthemum competition. She's a practical woman <laughs> in all respects. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Burns, meanwhile, throws a Christmas party with Scottish reels and bagpipes, rather like Rory Stewart's 50th birthday party a couple of weeks ago. Oh, do stop going on about it. For those of us who weren't there, which is basically all of us except you, <laughs> banging on about the party. Yeah, we like yeah. the party. Anyway, he does a foursome on a, on a dining table in full Highland dress with an enormous kilt and sporran. And they carry on as if they're in Bengal. They go duck shooting. The foxhounds, some of whom have made it through the Boland Pass alive, are taken out to hunt jackals. McNaughton continues his translation of the Arabian Nights with his blue tinted glasses. There's duck shooting. And the Afghans, as a rather uh, initially, appear to be very mild. And as a result, they lure the British into thinking that it's going to be an easy conquest. And they make their first and most vital mistake, which is to place the cantonments not in the Balahisar, the fort, up on a mountain, but in the plain outside mm. Kabul, surrounded on all sides by hill, exactly the place, to their great chagrin, that the Americans placed the uh, American embassy <laughs> in the recent uh, right. uh, in the recent round, and it's a completely indefensible site. That's fascinating. Okay, so so there they are. so they're relaxing, they're chillaxing. Um, the Afghans are showing resounding indifference, but not for long, because the Afghan nobles, whatever they're showing the front face to to the British, oh, they are chafing. They're not happy. So tell us what this unhappiness leads to. So initially, they are quite happy because many of them get jobs from Shah Shuja. They're paid to uh, fill his court, to fill his army. And as long as the gold keeps rolling out, they're fine. But what they find very quickly at the end of the first year, remember the East India Company is a business. It's there to make a profit. And they find that all these predictions of great markets for Manchester cottons and all the massive imports that are going to flood into the Kabul bazaars and so on, it's all complete pie-in-the-sky nonsense. The Afghans haven't got any money. They don't want to buy English goods. There's almost no trade. And very quickly, the company finds that this terrific conquest, which was you know, surprisingly easy in the end, despite the, the snipers in the Boland Pass, is making a massive loss. If you're going to keep Afghanistan, you need to put garrisons mm. in every valley, You need to keep supplies coming in from India. And remember, the Punjab at this point is now in chaos because Ranjit Singh has just died and there's a civil war in the in the Punjab. It's very difficult to get supplies through the Punjab. And it is a economic nightmare. And this is the point that all invaders find. They like the idea of invading Afghanistan because when they see it on a map, it's the roof of the world. They imagine that they can control the whole region from there. But when they get there, they find it's an economic nightmare and that the benef- the strategic benefits are outweighed by the costs. Now, might someone say, this is a, an example of regime change followed by not very good planning. Exactly. So what they do at the end of the first winter, and this is the crucial point, is that they cut the Afghan staff by half. So half the people who've been appointed to lucrative jobs by Shah Shuja now find that they're not making any money at all and they're out of a job. So you have this growing pool of discontent. And the day that the nobles are called in and sacked, the following morning, the Postboys are found in the approaches to Kabul with their necks slit. And from this point, no supplies get through to Kabul from India. The nobles make their discontent very clear uh, by, by cutting, basically cutting the supplies as a warning. Is, is McNaughton taking these warnings seriously? Does he understand that this is the start? This is only the start of something? McNaughton has absolutely no idea of what he's taken on. And he still thinks he's in Bengal. He's still playing cricket. He's still doing all the things that uh, British troops do uh, at this period, thinking that they're just you know fun and games and, uh, and a conquered country. Burns, meanwhile, has been totally sidelined. Because McNaughton's taken over the whole administration, he describes himself as a highly paid idler. He writes to one friend in 1841, I give paper opinions 
but never work them out. And he's, which is bizarre because he's almost certainly the most capable man there. He is. And McNaughton, who's who's senior to him and hates him because he's so influential, because he's got the gold medal from the Royal mm. Geographical Society and all the rest of it, is completely cut out. And, and so all Burns can do is boast about the luxuries of his life, lavish breakfast, cigars, drinking champagne, Madeira, claret, and fish all the way from Scotland. But what he doesn't say and this is the crucial thing, is that he also uh, begins carousing with the Afghan women. And this Uh is the thing that leads to (laughs) to, to, to trouble, unsurprisingly. Mm -hmm. One thing you don't do if you're an occupying force in Afghanistan uh, is is sleep with the chieftain's wives. And this is exactly what Burns does. Mm. And he actually, having, having pulled in all sorts of women from the bazaars and filled his house, allegedly, with Afghan women, he actually seduces the wife of one of the tribal leaders, a guy called uh, Abdullah Khan Achaksai. And uh, Abdullah Khan Achaksai's youngest wife runs away from his house in November 1841 and takes up residence with Alexander Burns. And this is the moment, this is the spark which sets the whole thing off. And again, we have the wonderful Mirza Atta, who gives an account of this. And he writes, when on inquiry, it was found that that was where she had gone. The Khan, beside himself with fury, sent his attendant to fetch the girl back. But the Englishman, swollen with pride, cursing and swearing, had the Khan's attendant severely beaten and thrown out of the house. So the Khan then summons the other tribal chieftains and says, and this is my favorite quote in the whole book, Mm. now we are justified in throwing off the English yoke. They stretch the hand of tyranny and dishonor private citizens, great and small. F***ing a slave girl isn't worth the ritual bath that follows it. But we have to put a stop right here, right now. Otherwise, these English will ride the donkey of their desires into the field of stupidity. Blimey. Uh, the bleep machine's in operation today again, then. <laughs> That's good. It's good, isn't it? Um, yes, I've decided. I've made an executive decision that <laughs> because so many of you do listen with your children, uh, Callum, <laughs> dust it off. <laughs> We're gonna, any effing and jeffing is going to be bleeped. Um, we've been told off for being... And if we do have scenes of very a graphic bit salty. violence... Yes, if we're salty or a bit graphic, we, we're going to do a little warning before that, I promise you. Um, okay, so rightio, that's, so that's not good, is it? <laughs> that's not good. This is how the quote right. ends. The other Sadars, his childhood friends, tightened their belts and girt their loins and prepared for jihad. Holy war. Oh dear, guess he girted loins. It just does not, <laughs> it's not, not. What is a girt? Of a loin. I mean, I've never understood that phrase. Why do you go to your loins? The loins of the Punjab. I just don't. don't, don't, I'm going to have to look up the etymology of this because there's a lot of loin girting that goes on in these stories. (laughs) What is it? Do you not girt your loins? I don't. I never have had cause to. (laughs) In West London. (laughs) No, no, I haven't. Um, But anyway, yes, I'm going to look that up for next time. Promise. Okay, so there we are. The stage is set for a kickback of loin girting proportions. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 so, this is all because the English rode the donkey of their desires into the field of stupidity. Well, yes. Avoid and, uh, doing that in Afghanistan. Yeah, I know, really. I mean, it just does seem just bonkers. Anyway, so join us next week when we find out what that looks like. And until then, it's goodbye from me, Anita Arnon. And goodbye from me, William Durrimple. 